Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Frank Lynn, director of the Cochlear Center for Hearing and Public Health at Johns Hopkins, about the FDA's decision to allow for over the counter hearing aids and how it could be a real game changer for the 40 million Americans with hearing loss. Let's listen. Frank Lynn, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. So the FDA has approved over-the-counter hearing aids. Tell us why that's significant. Oh, so there are uh, 40 million American adults with hearing loss, right? So this is, I mean, literally, this happens to everyone as we age. This is uh, two-thirds of everyone over 70. Um, so in that context, I would say even 10 years ago, seen as, ah, okay, you got some hearing loss, who cares? But that's all changed in the last decade now. For example, we now understand that hearing loss is arguably the single largest modifiable risk factor for dementia, um, as well as having a host of other health effects on just our overall ability to engage with others, depression rates, and things like that. So in that context, you know, the idea that we may soon have easy access to hearing aids is really important because those health effects that may come with hearing loss may in fact be potentially modifiable or treatable if we address hearing loss. And yet, uh, before these regs came out, um, hearing aids are incredibly expensive. I mean, the average cost of a pair of hearing aids that we estimated with the National Academies a few years ago was uh, $4,700. So that's pretty incredible. I mean, that means for the average American, a pair of hearing aids could be your third largest material purchase life after a house and a car, which is just absolutely crazy. So these regs, which have been eight years in planning, is a long time coming, and it's going to change that whole model on its end for the benefit of consumers and public health. So how affordable do we expect these to be? Will these be the same hearing aids we can get today? So great question. And, you know, no one knows in a good way. And what I mean by that is the general rule of thumb is that once something enters the over counter or like the consumer electronics space, costs just go down, down, down over time. I and mean, there's no example of a consumer technology that has not gone down over time. So how low will go, no one really knows. I think there's some good guesses. For example, if you look at component costs, they're not much different than the component costs of what a good hearable uh, should be. For example, a pair of like Galaxy earbuds or, uh, you know, Apple AirPods, right? I mean, the component costs are not much different. And obviously what the end cost could be, it gets that obviously, you know, um, marketing and the, the R&D involved and and any FDA procedures involved. So it, the cost could be a little higher, but I, I think there's no one has any doubt that it's going to be a relative fraction of what uh, current hearing aids Cost if you have to go through a uh, healthcare provider like me or an audiologist. So if I have hearing loss, I can just go to Costco and buy some hearing aids. <laughs> so yeah, so that's you know another whole another question away too is that what are the channels these eventual over the counter hearing is going to be sold through? Is it going to be through like a you know a CVS or Walgreens, or is it also going to be through Best Buy, or is it going to be online? I think people are literally just really beginning to figure this out now. I know some companies that we've been helping advise over the last few years. That's a lot of what we've been thinking about is what what is a channel for then an over the counter hearing aid? It's 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 crazy to say this, but it's a wide open market. It's never happened before. The U.S will literally be the first country in the entire world to have a regulated market for over-the-counter hearings. In many parts of the rest of the world, you, you can't buy a pair of hearing aids by going to a store. You have to go through a medical provider, just like you do in the States, and that's changing the state. So it's, it's pretty crazy to say, but it's wide open. So the channels of sale and distribution are just now beginning to be determined. So many people refuse to admit they even have hearing loss. Looking at you, my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess it's still going to be an education campaign to get these folks to get out there. There are two ways to answer that. So one is that you're absolutely right. A lot of people don't know they have a hearing loss, per se, even though all of us develop hearing loss as we age, in, invariably, right? So the running joke always is that you may not know, but everyone else around you sort of knows, right? But more importantly, I think there's always a little misinformation, too, where people think, oh, it's not it's not my hearing, it's that people aren't speaking clearly. But that that is what hearing loss is. 
things don't sound clearly because your inner ears don't are sending the sound clearly to your brain. So there's definitely that awareness campaign that needs to get out there around what it is to begin noticing hearing problems. The other more exciting thing is that out of the School of Public Health over the next, uh, actually uh, this week, uh, we are launching a campaign called the Know Your Hearing Number campaign. And the website for that is www.hearingnumber.org. This has been a year and a half in the planning. This is fundamentally a campaign that we're partnering with industry and various professional groups to push out, where it gets consumers to know their hearing number. And what I mean by that is just, it's literally a metric between zero and 100 which just tells you how loud sounds have to be for you to hear. And this is not a new number. This this is based off the audiogram. This is based off a standard clinical metric. But unfortunately, that clinical metric has always been sort of buried, and no one tells it back to the patient. So we use it all the time for research purposes. And the reason why I think this is so important is you realize that for any other chronic health condition, let's say high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, a lot of times consumers have some consumer-facing metric that they know about roughly. For example, you might roughly know, you know, blood pressure 140 is not great. If you have diabetes, you know, if your sugars get to be in the 150s, that's also not great, right? So people have a rough idea of a metric that can really guide behaviors. It can guide how we perceive the condition. It can guide how we pursue technology strategies thinking about it. And there's obviously far more metrics, more complicated than glucose or blood pressure, but from a consumer-facing side, there's one metric that consumers know about. For the hearing side of things, the ironic thing about hearing, despite hearing being a wash in numbers of precision, we can measure hearing, there's no consumer-facing metric. No one knows what their hearing is in quantitative terms. Like, oh, I've been told I have a mild to a moderate or moderate, or it just these terms are sort of somewhat meaningless, I hate to say it. So the idea is to really gauge, really drive consumers to begin knowing their hearing number, which amazingly, just in the last few years, because how smartphones advance, you can measure your hearing number on, for example, your Apple phone right now. Under the health app, you can actually literally get your hearing number, which is also called the four-frequency period tone average derived from the audiogram. And we feel that as consumers begin to be able to measure their own hearing and they know their metric, it can really shift behaviors. And I'll give you just one case in point example, right? We typically say when your hearing number is uh, 20 or, or, or less, which means everybody is considered normal hearing. So, uh, you know, I measure mine recently because I'm obviously just, we're, we're doing this whole campaign, so I had to measure my own hearing number. Mine's a 12 in my right ear and a 10 in my left ear. That's firmly, completely normal hearing by any stretch. And listen, I'm a 45-year-old man. I, I think my hearing is pretty good, actually, right? But then I had my daughter do it, who is 16 years old, and hers was a negative two, right? <laughs> which is really good. And it's completely normal for a 16-year-old girl. And I realized, huh, you know, I'm 45 and she's 16. And in 29 years, my hearing probably also used to be a negative two at one point. I've gone from negative two, which is really soft sounds, to a 12, which is still normal. But I've dropped actually 14 decibels. Sounds would be, sound be that much louder for me here, which is a big jump. And yet I have quote unquote normal hearing. So I think the reason why this is important is because it's not so much whether you have a normal, mild, moderate, severe. It's knowing your individual metric over time that can shift how you think about what your hearing means. Case in point for me, again, when I hear it, when I saw my number 12, I started using my AirPod Pros. My AirPod Pros have this built-in, it's called the conversation boost feature, which can amplify sounds based on your, your, your hearing test you input into your audiogram, into your, your Apple app. And I've, I've sort of gotten used to this. Now I put my AirPod Pros right now, and I'm wearing them right now talking to you. Sounds around me are slightly amplified, which I'm norm, I have normal hearing. Why should I need it? But I've sort of gotten used to it, actually. Because I, I appreciate there are probably sounds that I, I probably don't hear that, my, that I don't hear anymore. My daughter still does. So I think when you know that metric, it shifts behaviors. Because all of a sudden, one day I wake up and I'm six years old, I have a hearing loss right now. My hearing is worse than it was when I was 15 years old, and it's going to be worse 10 years from now. So if you get to monitor a number that's not stigmatizing, it's not labeling, it's not a binary yes or no, it really begins to shift in how I think my team personally, maybe I'm jaded, but how I think about adopting different technology strategies that allow me to hear my best. And that's finally what the campaign is about. It's driving that consumer public messaging to get people to be able to do something about it, especially when hearing has likely a huge impact on on our overall cognitive health, as well as our just ability to engage with others. You know, you make an interesting point about the cognitive health. So there's a link between hearing loss and dementia. And if you could explain that a little, because I guess what I am imagine is that when someone has hearing loss, they sort of just turn inward in a way that they aren't listening to what's going on around them. They're not really focusing on gaining new information. Is that sort of what's going on here? 
Yeah, you know, Stephanie, you sort of nailed one of the mechanisms right there. So for the last decade now, you know, research that's been coming out, uh, the Bloomberg School, um, as well as other places around the world, has been increasingly linking, you know, hearing loss with a risk of dementia. And it's been incredibly consistent in the epidemiology studies across countries, across investigators, across across research groups, showing, again, the greater your hearing number or the greater the amount of hearing loss you have, the greater, on average, people's risk of dementia is. And, you know, a lot of people used to think, when this was first described years and years ago, actually, initially back in the 70s, actually, that, oh, it's just because um, uh, there's some type of confounding or common cause, namely uh, aging explains both, or maybe uh, cardiovascular disease explains both. But when you do these, you know, these very careful epidemiological that, that follow people for many, many years, you see even after you control and you adjust for age and diabetes, smoking, whatever, that could just act as a common cause, you're still seeing a very strong link. So now we think there are actually probably three major mechanisms through which hearing loss could directly increase dementia risk. So one is what you get up before, is that if you have hearing loss, you're increasingly socially isolated, you're, you're lonely, you're not engaged with others, you're participating in less cognitively stimulating activities, those have all been directly tied to increased risk of dementia. So that loss of activities, loss of social engagement, increased loneliness. So that's one mechanism. The second mechanism gets that idea of what we call cognitive load. And it's the idea that when your brain is constantly receiving a much more garbled signal from your ear, your brain's constantly having to work harder and literally sort of rededicate brain resources to helping with decoding that sound, helping with hearing. And that comes at the expense of other systems, like our thinking and memory abilities. So this idea of it's sort of a constant load in the system. Um, the third idea is, sounds related, but it's actually a little different. And it's the idea that hearing loss in of itself by providing sort of by leading to um, more auditory deprivation, less auditory stimulation of the brain, that that can literally possibly the faster rates of brain atrophy. So literally parts of the brain begin shrinking or atrophying faster if it's sort of deprived of sound. And we actually see that both in animal models as well as if you follow um, people for many, many years with serial MRI scans, we're also seeing that as well. So three major mechanisms which we think hearing loss could directly contribute to dementia risk. They're not mutually exclusive. It's like a combination of all three. But that, we think in many ways, explains now why we're seeing such a strong link in the epidemiologic studies between greater hearing loss and average risk of dementia over time. So how soon will we see these hearing aids on the shelves? Ah, so um, theoretically, as early as mid-October of this year, the law basically gives the FDA, um, once the final regulation is released, 60 days before it gets an act in the Federal Register, which when they actually go into effect. We're anticipating some companies that have been plans for, for years. So we expect them to probably hit the market very, very quickly. They want to be first to market. So I think some device will probably start in shelves even by end of October, uh, definitely by Christmas. But there'll be a whole slew of other companies coming out in the next six months to a year or two, mainly because the way the federal regulations are enacted is that companies are very appropriately so they have to get, it's a, called a 510K process to the FDA. They need to get, um, they need to notify the FDA in advance of doing this, submit some evidence that their device are meeting specifications. And I think that all makes a lot of sense that that ensures the devices hitting the market will be both safe and effective, which is what we all care about. So Merry Christmas, here's a hearing aid. (laughs) Franklin, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely, thanks, Stephanie. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes Fernandez and Amber Bryan Singletary. Thank you for listening.